Well, our particular campaign in the European Agency for Safety and Health at Work is about psychosocial risks and stress in the workplace. And the reason we decided on that topic is because our board is tripartite, governments, unions and employers, and they were concerned about the growing level of work-related stress, psychosocial risks in the workplace, and they decided to dedicate the world's biggest occupational safety and health campaign to this topic. And in doing so, we've done quite a bit of research. We have um, dedicated studies, our SNR studies, which ask companies and workers um, how they feel about this problem. What are the barriers to them dealing with the problem? And what are the drivers to help them overcome the problem? And so what we also have done is in identifying the problem, we've come up with some tools that companies can use to address the issue of psychosocial risk. It's really very worrying that the issue is on the rise. So for us, standing still is not an option. And it's very costly. If you're not convinced by the um, by the altruistic desire to uh, you know, take care of workers, it's also a very costly business. So there are really good arguments for attacking this issue head on. Yes, we do see uh, some differences in um, countries, but we also see differences in sectors. But one of the big lessons um, I have learned, certainly from uh, working in this campaign for the past two years, is that no sector is immune. And no person is immune um, because it doesn't matter what level you're at at an organization or what age you are, indeed. It, uh, stress can strike at any time, whether you're in the top management or in the lower echelons of the, of the workplace. So, um, yeah, so I think we see um, sectoral differences. And of course, there, I have to say, we see a growing problem in in public services and in the service industries where people are in contact with members of the public. We've looked at this and also our colleagues in Eurofound have looked at this interlinking. Um, for example, one of the big reasons uh, for work-related stress is the way work is organized and also um, overload of work and long working hours. And we see, we do uh, see that this can affect men and women differently, particularly when you consider that they have differing roles in the family. So there's a huge impact impact on family life as well as in working life. I think the evidence we have um, in terms of um, in terms of looking at long hours is that it's not so much which day of the week you are working for us it's a question that every worker has to get adequate rest now there are other cultural issues around the Saturday and Sunday working and in particular for the Sunday working I think I think it's interesting what the recent Eurofound uh, survey has to say about this. There's an increasing number of people having to work on Sundays, an increasing number of people uh, having uh, are saying that it is impacting on their on their family lives. From the occupational safety and health point of view, we're very keen that workers get adequate rest. But I think if you look at that European Working Conditions Survey from Eurofold, you will see that that Sunday working is definitely impacting as well on family life. The strategic framework on occupational safety and health was adopted by the Commission and um, their June of last year. And um, what they have done is they have identified now some areas where they're going to, to move on. And I think my understanding, but you would have to check that with the Commission, my understanding is that one of their big priorities for, let's say, 2016 um, is carcinogens, the carcinogens, uh, the review of the carcinogens directly.
directive. But regarding the uh, work programme of the Commission um, and regarding, I mean, even though health and safety is not mentioned specifically in the work programme of the Commission, we know that there is, of course, work ongoing in the Commission on occupational safety and health. Um, what would be interesting um, is, is to see um, what their next plans are in this area. And it's true that they have done now an evaluation of all of the directives and early in 2016 they are going to outline their next steps in that area. Yeah, well, that is the aim of the framework directive, um, to have, let's say, harmonised minimum standards. And indeed, technically, they exist already. And um, we often get the feedback that after 2004, when new member states joined, that they found that the, the fact that there was an existing level of um, community acquis on health and safety was one of the real drivers for them to improve health and safety in those countries. So absolutely, I believe that um, there is a place at European level for um, harmonised minimum occupational safety and health standards. And by the way, they are agreed by all member states and they are in force. It's always, um, for, for me, I, I think it's always interesting to see public and civil society engaged in issues which, um, which relate to occupational safety and health and which relate to work protection. Because, I, I will repeat, if you're not convinced by the, um, by the humanitarian argument of keeping workers safe, or if you're not, you know, um, if you're not convinced by the legal obligation which is on all employers. There is a huge cost factor and we're doing more and more work in Bilbao on the cost-benefit ratio of good health and safety in Europe's workplaces. And we show that there's a real benefit to be had if you have good um, working conditions.